right. Folks, this is Alan Dick. I'm one of the co-founders of Commerce Next, and I just want to welcome you to our webinar for the day. Today's topic is digital acceleration is the new normal for e-commerce. Today is Wednesday, May 13th, and I want to welcome our speakers, Tim Hartman. He's the VP of Digital Commerce at Hugo Boss. Jamie O'Gorman, he's with Client Services with Exponia. And finally, Shauna Hausman, the CMO of Health e-commerce. Our moderator, Veronica Sonsev, her computer froze. She'll be joining us here in just a moment. When she does, she'll pick it back up, but we're going to keep going. Today, our agenda is going to be, we're going to review some housekeeping notes. We're going to take a look then at some BizRate Insights uh, consumer data that we have for you this week. Exponia is going to be going through some of their market insights. And finally, we're going to take a look at some audience polls and get into some good panel discussion with our, our panel today. One thing I want to go over with you is how to use the system. Now, by the way, you don't have to worry about missing anything. We're recording this webinar and we'll make it available for replay, be available by tomorrow. And let me show you where things are on your screen. First up, at the very top where the very subtle red arrow is pointing, you can see Q&A polls and handouts. That's where you can ask questions. If you have a question uh, that you want to ask the panel, please uh, just use the Q&A functionality, ask the question. Uh, when you do ask a question, you can notice that you can upvote it. So someone asks a question, you think that question is really good, upvote it. That signals us that that's a topic that more than one person wants to hear about on the call. And we're just going to be, it'll just uh, clue us in to make certain that we get to that one sooner rather than later. Next up, handouts. The draft slide, the slides are all available here uh, for you to download uh, to either follow along at home or use them afterwards. And finally, if you're listening to this on the recording uh, of this webinar, the handouts are all available by clicking on this icon, the document icon that you see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Scott Silverman. I'm also one of the co-founders of Commerce Next. And uh, while Veronica is uh, rebooting her computer, I uh, have been working closely with BizRate on some of the uh, research that we've been doing with them. And um, is, is some, if those, those of you who may have been on a call uh, about three weeks ago or so, we asked uh, folks on the call if they had some specific questions they wanted to ask consumers and we were able to uh, partner with BizRate Insights and have them go in into their consumer panel and ask them some questions. So uh, I was just about to go into the results but it sounds like Veronica is now back on so I'm going to let her pick it up from here. Veronica are you there? Right. Well, I'll keep going until I hear Veronica chime in. Um, so we uh, asked a number of questions uh, to, to consumers. So there, this was done around uh, the uh, towards the end of April, and uh, there were 1,030 consumers uh, kind of spread out between genders and ages, uh, and you know we asked we were trying to get a handle on a few different areas. One was around uh, some of the different habits that they have acquired due to uh, stay at home uh, type of restrictions and ones that, you know, of these shopping habits, which ones were they expecting that they would be continuing even after they uh, didn't have to shop online exclusively. And so some of these uh, are things like they're just going to be shopping online more in general or curbside pickup. Um, and these are really significant for our community um, because we know that things like curbside pickup is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to scale. And we're seeing, um, as we're going to be talking more on the call a little bit later um, with the panels, panelists, that, uh, you know, this is one of those areas of digital acceleration that uh, is, uh, you know, putting a lot of pressure on on retailers, but you can go through and see some of these, uh, you know, that they're going to continue to work from home or do things like buy online and pick up in store. Uh, we also asked them uh, 
to tell us, you know, when the economy opens back up, uh, you know, to regular shopping, you know, how do you expect your, you know, your, your spending to compare to pre-coronavirus spending in some different categories? So as you can see here, here and I know it's a little bit small, but um, the ones that are going to be picking up the most are on the top, um, kind of going down. So clearly the essential ones like you know, healthcare, um, home goods, grocery, pet supplies um, are going to pick up the uh, the fastest, and then you know others that are non-essential. It's a little more challenging. So uh, those are things like office equipment and supplies, sporting goods, uh, computer, video game, furniture. Uh, and in terms of you know their spending habits uh, after the uh, after the uh, the pandemic is getting behind them, uh, we're seeing that uh, really it's there's a lot of uh, we expect consumers to be frugal. Uh, I think a lot of consumers are in saving mode right now. So you're seeing that some of the uh, the answers that they are that are more popular than with them are purchasing only items that are needed or increasing. The amount of money that they are saving, um, looking for discounts and coupons. Um, so that's, uh, I think, one of the things we can expect from consumers moving forward. Uh, and we're seeing that younger consumers are also going to be uh, pulling back on spending more than the older groups. So I think some of the younger folks, maybe they're um, new in new in, in the workforce. Um, they're not as close to retirement. Uh, they're dealing with more uh, volatile income situations are uh, the ones that are going to be more effective, more uh, likely to be pulling back on their spending. And uh, we also asked uh, from this BizRate survey, the brands that they may have discovered or started to use um, during, the, during the coronavirus. And some of these are pretty, uh, ones that you would expect like Zoom, um, Clorox products, Instacart, um, Amazon, I think is, a you know, one to point out. Um, they, you know, lots of stories about them continuing their dominance uh, or even growing their market share. And then we asked, you know, which of these brands do you think are doing a really good job during the coronavirus? And again, Amazon really stands out along with some cleaning products, but it's, you know, also seeing some other retailers in there like Walmart, uh, Kroger, um, zooms in there uh, uh, as well again. All right, so uh, we wanted to uh, thank our sponsor Exponia uh, for uh, being a part of this webinar. They have been doing some really interesting work looking at new consumer behavior. I had a chance to um, you know take some time to speak with their CEO Peter uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we started this new video series at Commerce Next called conversations with Commerce Next, where I got to hear his opinion. And we have one of his colleagues uh, with us today that is going to be helping out with the, you know, sharing some of those insights and a framework that they're looking at for some of this new consumer behavior. So, uh, Jamie, do you want to pick up from here? Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, great to be here as well. Um, so first things first, I'll just do a very brief introduction to who Exponia are for those of you who aren't, uh, haven't heard of us before. So these are some of the brands that we work with. Um, the, the person who was mentioned uh, is actually our CEO, is the, the taller guy on the, the Forbes cover just there. Um, and the, the screen grabs there are actually some of the insights into our platform. Um, just very briefly, um, we are a customer data platform. We have a campaign execution layer as well, so we're able to actually and deliver campaigns based on the data that we collect. So we track, combine, and analyze customer data at individual level, um, both online, offline. We combine it. We allow businesses to understand uh, more about their customer behavior at a granular level uh, and in real time. So you can actually see customers uh, browsing your website uh, in real time, which is definitely an interesting thing. Um, and you can then use that data to execute campaigns uh, either at an individual level, kind of using uh, AI or machine learning, uh, or kind of a mass level um, through emailing, website, Facebook, any channels at all. Um, but I'm not here to talk about Exponia. Um, I'm here to ask the following question, um, which is, are you ready for the, the new normal? So 
what we've done um, is we've taken a look across our entire data set. Um, so that's more than a billion customer profiles. These are just some of the brands that uh, we work with um, across multiple countries. And we've built a framework to try and help companies understand better and navigate the, the new normal and really understand where they are today. And um, there are a couple of links in this, um, which I'll come back to at the end, which if you're interested, you can go and take the assessment yourself and we can give uh, actually some follow up next steps based on the results and where you sit within this framework. So what I'm going to talk about is four of the key findings and insights that we've seen and some of the recommendations that we're that we're going to talk about. Um, first of which is machine learning just hasn't had time to catch up based on new behavior patterns. The first thing that happens when there's a big shock um, to the system is that machine learning and people and uh, these programs, which have been using 12 months, uh, 18 months worth of data, start to get confused. And what we've seen is smart channels, which we would typically look at as anything which is run by an algorithm or, or kind of is learning based on that historic data to make recommendations or to target certain customer groups are really struggling at the moment. Some of those are starting to catch up, but with each new shock, that's starting to, to change the, the dynamics of how these systems are working. So one of the recommendations that we have is if you're using machine learning um, to dramatically reduce that, that learning time frame. So if it was 30 days before, you should be looking at maybe even 14 days or something like that, and looking at it every few days to make sure that if there's something dramatic within the market that's changed, that you're addressing that and making sure that you're not spending money on things which don't make sense. One of the best examples I can take here is from one of our Amazon style businesses that we work with um, who were selling hand sanitizers, which obviously an amazing product at the moment. Um, obviously they sold out very quickly. Uh, they had a, a fantastic restock program. So within three days they had that product in stock and they started retargeting anyone who'd searched for that product but not purchased. Turned out to be a disaster of a campaign because uh, people who buy some are looking for sanitizer wanted in that moment and three days later, they don't have that need anymore. So by removing those uh, anomalies, you can actually save significantly on your campaigns. So something to take a look at. Um, secondly, um, we see this across all markets, uh, customer buying times have shifted. So particularly if you look at things like fashion uh, retailing or fast fashion e-commerce, uh, there was very often a, a peak uh, during a commuting period. So if you live in a, a major city or something like that, as people are going to work uh, on public transport, they're typically looking at, okay, what are the newsletters coming into my inbox? What's interesting for today? Maybe I'll purchase later on this evening, which is why you also tend to see a spike in the end of the day. Now, the yellow is uh, March and the blue is April. So overall, we've seen a drop in the number of purchases. But what is interesting is you can see that very pronounced drop off during the, the commuting time and a very flattened uh, actual um, set of purchases throughout the day. So depending on different people's working patterns, and more importantly, the actual purchasing time, peak purchasing time has shifted by one hour in the evening as people are actually finishing a little bit later um, and have more kind of things to do in the home. So if, you're, if you have set up campaigns to go out at certain times around previous customer behavior, you should be looking at if this hasn't changed and potentially testing new behaviors uh, and testing these new times. Um, this looked complicated, but it's it's uh, not in the end. So this uh, numbers on the top are actually the number of touch points um, which customers are taking on average to make a purchase. And I'll make it very easy from the left to the right. So during uh, from the beginning of the year until middle of April, what we saw for this particular company is that it was a five percentage point increase in the number of single touch purchases. So what that means is that customers um, in this particular business were very clear on what they wanted to buy. They knew how to buy it. They went to the website. They had the relevant information then and there. were able to make that immediate purchase. They're not going to stores. They're not comparing with as many other, other online stores. So if they have enjoyed that experience, they're actually really making those single purchase uh, decisions based on that single touch point. So what we're recommending here is if you're seeing this sort of trend to actually potentially reallocate some of that retargeting budget towards acquisition of new customers and making sure that that relevant information is to the front um, of, of that customer buying journey. So again, to go back to another uh, business that we work with, um, we saw the inverse of this for their business. So they actually saw a five percentage point decrease in the number of single uh, conversions. And as soon as they brought uh, the delivery information forward and the returns information forward to that, that journey, 
they actually switched it to the reverse and now they're enjoying significantly better ROI. And then just the final insight that we've seen. So uh, despite being a marketer for more than 10 years um, in online retail, uh, particularly fashion, I'm not someone who purchases online. Um, so obviously within the current situation, I don't have much of a choice if I want to buy something. So I'm what would be considered as someone who's relatively new as a, as a shopper. So I'm, I'm a new person in the market. And uh, basically, I've experienced all three of these. And um, so I have experience where I've really loved the service and I would actually consider in the future. So for example, I bought something I never thought I would buy online, which is a guitar, which is a really expensive purchase. I would love to go into a store and try it, but I purchased it online. And the experience was so good um, from a customer, customer service point of view. Um, the returns policy, everything was amazing. And I would look at using them in the future. Um, however, I've had a, also an experience I hated and I will not use their service again. Um, which is actually in the grocery area, which I expected to be a much better experience. I spent more than an hour building my shopping basket, um, only to find out in the checkout that I would have to wait four to five weeks for my delivery, which obviously is not a great experience and has put me off shopping through that brand uh, in the future. So this is something that's really important to think about. Do you have that experience with your customers that are going to make them really love that? Because this is a very unique situation where there's a new market potentially coming or you're potentially taking new customers from people who are not able to, to adapt to that, that kind of new normal and um, to make sure that you're really the person that once this uh, new normal becomes apparent, that you're ready to, to make the most of that, that market. And just the final slide, so I'll come back to this. I would just again ask the question, so where do you see yourselves at the moment in the quadrant? So do you have the data needed to make decisions? Are you able to make those decisions? Um, as you said, there's an assessment here if you're interested. I think it's about 30 different questions from all sorts of different aspects. Um, and there'll be some follow-up uh, results based on uh, based on your, your input. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. I am back. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties um, at just the opportune time. Um, we're now going to move into the polls. So I'm going to kick it off with some polls. I just want to remind you all where you can find the answers once the polls kick off. They'll, if you just go into the poll section and go to closed polls, you'll see the results. So um, I'm going to start the first poll. How have you streamlined decision making during the pandemic? And the options are substantially streamlined, lightly streamlined, did not streamline decision making. All right, answers are starting to come in. Great. Awesome. I'm going to close this right now. Um, it seems like on the majority of folks, at least slightly streamlined decision making, some significantly streamlined it. Um, next question, given the rising importance of digital and e-commerce, how will your team needs adjust, um, including, you know, shifting workers? So substantial increase in digital e-commerce headcount, slight increase in digital e-commerce headcount, no adjustments or a decrease. So we're trying to see kind of given the importance of e-commerce right now, whether you expect headcount to change. One more minute, one more second here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Um, it seems like most folks are expecting um, no change in staff, maybe a slight increase. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Then which aspects of your omni-channel roadmap are getting prioritized this year? Um, so there's a few options here, including store inventory visibility, curbside pickup, ship from store, virtual try-on, 
appointment setting, new payment options, updating return policies and procedures, and other. And if you have an other, you can put it in the Q&A for us to see what your response is. It's interesting some of the priorities that are that are um, getting prioritized. Obviously, curbside pickup, something that has been very popular since the pandemic. Updating return policies and procedures, ship from store, some appointment settings, some new payment options. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this out. And then we have one final question. This question is more of a tee up for our webinar next week. Given the rapidly changing circumstances, with COVID-19, how have you had to tune your personalization algorithms? Um, so made substantial adjustments, slight adjustments, adjustments were needed but not made, switched to manual slash rules-based recommendations, no adjustments were needed. And this kind of tees up, this is the point that Jamie teased out in his presentation, really talking about um, some of the issues with AI um, in some cases during the, the fact that the environment change so quickly. All right, I'm going to close this out. It looks like most people had to make some adjustments um, or switch to rules based. Interesting. Uh, very few didn't require any adjustments at all. To close this. All right. So if you want to see the polls, um, just a reminder, go to polls closed. You'll see the answers to everything. We're going to switch to the panel now, and we're all going to try to turn on our cameras. And just given um, Murphy's Law and everything that can happen, be patient with us. If the cameras don't work, we'll go back to audio. But we're going to try to turn on our cameras to make this more interactive. All right. We're almost all almost all here. All right. So uh, I'm going to kick this off. My first question is really for Tim and Shauna. What are some of the ways that your company quickly pivoted during the COVID-19 pandemic in order to better serve your customers? Um, Shauna, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Healthy Commerce, you know, we are a um, digital first retailer that services the over 70 million consumers with tax free health and wellness accounts. So we're the parent company of FSAstore.com, HSAstore.com and welldeservedhealth.com. So, you know, our story is a little bit different um, in, in how this affected us. You know, obviously, we don't have the same omnichannel challenges that are being faced by many retailers. Um, but what we faced um, in the surge that we were dealing with was really around how consumers were, were impacted by COVID-19 and their, their appetite for health related products. You know, they were looking to protect themselves against COVID and treat and potentially treat symptoms of COVID-19. Um, you know, for the products that people in the past would just run to their local pharmacy for, you know, we always had a strong business, but this was a really an unprecedented kind of shift. Um, people were coming to us looking specifically for these products that all of a sudden were very hard to find. So um, as they were coming online and and looking for these things, they were also trying to use their health savings accounts. You know, everyone was trying to stretch their dollars and there was a lot of economic uncertainty. So. Um, you know, we found ourselves in a situation where normally at this time of year, we're talking about spring allergy season and all of a sudden we're back into like cold and flu mode uh, in a big, big way. So our seasonality just completely shifted um, with with very little warning. So we had to pivot all of our priorities around merchandising, site creative, um, marketing, everything had to completely shift into a virus preparedness 
approach. And that was the messaging we moved to. Um, you know, the products like thermometers and pulse oximeters and things that we had always sold for years, um, you know, were at the forefront of all of our messaging. So we were, um, you know, we had to, to really move quickly. You know, we were, we were in the moment changing creative on the site, redoing site architecture, um, scrapping and redoing all of our marketing. And, you know, and we felt good about it because this is really, uh, these are products people really needed. And there was a lot of anxiety and wanting to, to find those things. And, um, you know, and, and we, we saw this as a great way to allow people to kind of use those savings accounts and get these products tax free, you know, pre, with pre-tax dollars, I should say. Um, but, you know, that was really a scramble, uh, even though we were course, set up, yeah. already, you know. <laughs> well, the product demand completely changed literally in a matter of a week. Tim, what did you see on your end? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tim Hartman. Um, as introduced, I work, introduced, I work, I work, uh, I work, um, the so yeah, similarly, Shauna was a good example. I mean, Hugo Boss is known for, uh, for suiting, for workwear, and we had to quickly pivot as people weren't uh, going into the office anymore and were mainly working from home. So we had to completely shift our on-site merchandising strategies, what was relevant for people in their lives at that time, what they wanted to see, what they wanted to buy, what they wanted to relate to. So we changed our stories, our, our site architecture, our navigation. We shifted the messaging. We actually had a big wedding uh, campaign planned, um, oh, given God. that we on formal wear business. Yeah, and it just didn't make sense to go forward with it anymore. You just had to be relevant during this time. And we also started to see the site as a little bit of an information center too, um, that people wanted to know how, you know, were your orders safe? Were they coming on time? What's your response? What's your company doing to help fight at this time? Um, so yeah, it became really important, but we also similarly shifted our supply chain. So we had, you know, we have 60 stores in the United States. So we had a lot of inventory that was potentially going to those stores and we shifted it to our e-com digital DC to be able to fulfill an increase in orders that we were going to be expecting. So we had to be pretty nimble in the last minute too. At the same time, adjusting some of our policies, like extending our return window, uh, up staffing on customer service to be able to answer some of those questions and making sure uh, we were keeping things like when we would send our product to our DC, it had to sit for 48 hours just for safety cautious. So we had to, we had to make some pretty significant changes pretty quickly. That's a, a lot of really fast pivoting. Um, you know, how did, how were you guys able to streamline decision making and in order to make those types of quick decisions? Um, Tim, do you want to continue and then we'll go to Shauna? Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. I think what I've seen now has been like a flattening of the organization a little bit from our end. I think, you know, in the times of of crisis or change or disruption, you don't necessarily have the luxury of time to have several meetings before approval, to be able to put all the presentations together, to be able to maybe gather to kind of a 110% certainty before you make a decision. So I think we worked to enable the people that were the closest to it to be able to make those decisions. And with all of us working from home, you know, there's always kind of a hierarchy of how you communicate in an organization with all of us working from home. It was very much like if I had a question for Veronica, I might not go to Veronica's boss to get the answer from Veronica. I'm just going to chat her right now and be like, hey, I need your help with this. You know, what's the answer? Let's get it done together. So increased efficiency, being able to communicate more streamlined. We created a task force for wider problems. So we meet once a day to kind of uh, understand what changes are coming and what we can work on and what decisions we need. And then, so we have a, we're a global organization. So we're also looking to see what unfolds with China to see how far we are behind them and Europe to say, okay, if we, if we look at the, we stress test the curve, we should be coming up on where they're at in two weeks. So we can streamline the decision-making by being more prepared for something like that. And Shauna, how, how did you guys streamline? Yeah, I mean, Tim a lot of, their decision making structure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of what Tim is saying um, really resonates because we had to do, you know, a lot of the similar similar things. Um, one of the things that we, we got a real um, kind of a surprise in the middle of all this, which was that 
um, you know, as COVID was ramping up, um, the CARES Act was passed by Congress. Mm. And what, what people may not realize is that um, part of that legislation included um, the opening up of two huge new product categories for us, which are over-the-counter medications and feminine care slash menstrual care products that are now eligible for FSA and HSA funds. So, I mean, this was, you know, <laughs> an enormous piece of legislation that we had been, we and others had been advocating for for many years. And I think, um, you know, due to the situation with, with the health crisis, they, um, they, they were kind of pushed through as a benefit to consumers. So, you know, this was something that all of a sudden in the midst of kind of doing these fast pivots around what products people were looking for, it was like, okay, now we have to launch these two enormous categories yeah. of goods, thousands of SKUs, um, you know, and, and in, our, in our business, which is really um, the categories are determined, like it's just in essence, in essence, like our product assortment is determined by the IRS. I don't know any other retailer that has that situation. So for us, you know, a couple thousand new new products to spin up um, was just massive. And, and in the midst of all the other pivoting and just the normal like lift to all the regular business. Um, so we did a similar thing as what Tim was describing. You know, we put together a cross-functional task force. Um, you know, we called it the OTC and FemCare uh, task force. And we, we got together like nearly daily and said, all right, what are we going to do? We've got to tell people that the legislation has passed because this is really big news. And it was, you know, people could already, um, it was actually backdated to January. So we wanted to tell people as soon as possible, like if you've been buying over the counter meds from other people, you know, we're also just an advocate in general for you to go get, get that FSA dollar to work harder for you. Um, and then it was like, we got to do a phase one. When can we get the products phase one? Let's get the OTC products in as soon as possible. We'll hot on the heels. We'll be phase, you know, phase two with the, with the FemCare launch. So we've been just, I mean, normally this is the kind of thing that this organization would probably have spent, you know, six to nine months planning. And we were like, well, we've got four weeks. So <laughs> let's just, you know, spin up across every channel. Um, and, and it's in addition, you know, there's, there's a ramp up for an organization like ours, which, you know, is very, like I said, very steady. We are very predictable seasonality, um, very deadline driven, as many people know who have had FSAs, you know, there's, it's use it or lose it. So you get to those deadline periods and people really start to spend. All of a sudden people were seeing this as kind of a safety net for their wallets. I mean, they, they could go out and buy products that are really necessary to them at this moment and, and really all every day. Um, so we wanted to get this up as soon as possible. So we are, you know, we've got supply chain challenges like every other retailer out there. You know, we're spinning up new vendors, which is always a, a process, you know, and as everyone knows, um, you know, and setting up these products, re, re architecting the entire site, you know, redoing our taxonomy to accommodate these products. Um, so, you know, we we have gotten very, very nimble. We're making real time decisions. And I think you just you just have to. And, you know, that's that will hopefully continue in a way, you know, obviously you don't wish for something like this to happen that sparks all of this change, but maybe the good that will come out of this is that, you know, we, we realize what can be possible, you know, similar to working from home and still being efficient, you know, everyone's yep. really in it together and, and these decision making processes are evolving, you know, by the minute. Yep. Absolutely. It's, it, 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 you know, I think, I think the brands these days have had to make decisions that would normally take months in a matter of days and mm -hmm. then roll out the implementation mm -hmm. that in a matter of weeks, it's, it's been incredible, which is why we wanted to, to we picked this topic for the webinar because it has really accelerated very quickly. Um, I wanna ask Jamie a question because I know Jamie, you can kind of look across the industry through a number mm -hmm. of your clients. What are some good industry examples of, of quick pivots that you've seen um, that are exemplary of, of digital acceleration? Yeah, I guess other than every fashion retailer selling lounge and casual wear very successfully at the moment, no matter what your business was right. before. Um, I, I guess uh, people preserving cash flow, so all of the, the vouchers and, and even like uh, increased vouchers rather than giving cash uh, refunds and things like that. But I would say that the strongest example I've seen, and it, it ties into a little bit the, the decision-making speed that, that's kind of come about, it's actually a, a restaurant train that we work with. So they have 100 venues across uh, the whole of the UK. And pretty much overnight, they lost their entire revenue business, all of the, the chefs and, and waiters inside the, the restaurants. Obviously, that's an incredible shock to the, the business and really not not more than a couple of weeks to really think about what might happen. Um, that was, I think, six weeks ago. And since then, 
um, they've actually launched an entire online business. Um, so they've pivoted from offline physical stores and we're sending you emails about, do you want to book a, a table for, for Friday? To actually, we've repurposed all of our kitchens. We've set up a delivery service. We need to figure out how to do curbside drops, all of this kind of stuff. Yep. And they turned that around in less than six weeks. Um, a major chain with 100 venues. And that, that to me, is absolutely incredible. And I was speaking to, to, to one of the guys who was organizing that. And what they've actually said is post-COVID that that's probably going to be driving about 10% of their revenue. They hadn't planned to do that for another year and a half. They had kind of a two-year roadmap to build up to it. And they've just said, okay, we've got five, six weeks, guys. Let's turn this around. And um, that, that for me, is, is probably one of the most inspirational stories I've, I've heard so far. Well, yeah. In the U.S., we've seen the same thing. We've seen a number of stores either like spin up curbside pickup really quickly or spin up ship from store. You know, all of these things that this pandemic has really necessitated. And actually, Jamie, one question, I don't know if, if, if you would be in a good position to ask it, but Doug Jensen asks, when do you think machine learn learning algorithms will catch up and do a better job of predicting behaviors? When, when will the lockdown end? Yes, hard <laughs> <question. Is> that, <laughs> I think the, the, the important part of it is what is the length of time you can build up a significant data set? Yeah. That's, that's the biggest challenge. So if every week you're, you're having a dramatic change, so, okay, now we can go outside, but next week, okay, we've seen a spike in cases again. So now everyone can't go outside or now this, this drug, so to, to talk to kind of Shauna's thing, now this drug, which is available through this service, is, okay, everyone needs to buy it because actually it's proven to be helpful. Well, how, how do you adapt to that? So I think most, most data sets, what you're looking at is kind of 30 days of plus minus some sort of consistency in behavior. Anything below that is fairly susceptible to some volatile changes. You can still be quite, um, quite uh, I, I would say, like targeted for a smaller data set, but you have to really be careful with it and you have to monitor it very closely. So honestly, I would say that you're looking at this every couple of days as, as the, the world changes around you and you're probably not looking for any consistency in, in machine learning until probably few weeks months it, it really i don't see i don't see it uh, stabilizing anytime soon i don't know what uh, the other guys think about that yeah. I mean, there's too many <laughs> variables changing if you change your promotional strategy you change who you're acquiring it's it's you're not going to be able to get a consistent read for sure yeah but i guess if you're able to split out at least some of the the different customer profiles and group them into some kind of collective audience yeah. and try and find some commonalities you can start to maybe do some more uh, localized targeting based on region or based on on specific customer types or how long they've been are they someone who just came now to to this service they're brand new so there are some things that you can learn but you have to be uh, a lot more i would say um granular in, in terms of that analysis yeah I agree yeah. micro mm -hmm. and it was interesting that some of the people in the survey mentioned that they were just switching to manual recommendations just because mm -hmm. they didn't feel like they could rely on them um which is unfortunate, but just the reality of, of the situation. Um, I'm going to pull one more um, audience question, and I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions in the Q&A box, um, and we'll go through and ask them during this, this um, panel discussion. But Akalish Srivatsava um, asked, you know, do you have any measurable data on the lift and conversion rate by showing delivery information on the PVP cart and checkout? So I think what he's um, actually asking about is I think there's been, at least in the beginning of the pandemic, there was definitely some hiccups in getting product out there. And are you seeing, you know, any kind of lift by just communicating that you can ship and the timing is that you'll be shipping the products? Yeah, we've seen, so we've tested it before. We've tested delivery information at the PDP level or on the homepage level. And yeah, we've seen significant increases in conversion rate during this. Um, but I actually think that people are less, at least in my industry with fashion, they're less concerned with the immediacy because there probably isn't an impending event that they need it for. So I think during the regular course of your life, you actually probably wanted to know delivery. Now I think your concern about delivery is, is it going to be safe? What is the time frame? But I don't necessarily need to know that I'm going to receive it tomorrow if it's not an essential good, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think part of it is just letting consumers know when. I don't think that they're exactly. like consumers have definitely got much more comfortable with delays in 
um, in delivery, but they just want to they just want to know when to accept it and know that you're shipping. Yeah, yeah, we've seen the same exact thing. Yeah, and I guess what happens if I don't like it is the you know is it the same as before or has something changed and that that's something which I think is much more prevalent now. So uh, the one of the the companies I mentioned earlier, they actually saw forty in the first week of the, the lockdown when they were uh, kind of adjusting their business 45 percent of their traffic went to their what happens uh, what's the returns policy and what what are the methods of payments and what happens if i need yeah. a refund mm -hmm. and all of this so it was it's almost half of their traffic so there's definitely a demand but I, I guess at some stage it starts to be a little bit more normalized um, and i think there are some kind yeah. of consistent approaches across retailers which become accepted but i would agree with tim that delivery speed is is not nearly as important as as safety or quality right now. Yeah, I mean, even Amazon couldn't deliver at, at, at their previously one to two day timeline. Um, what, one thing we asked during the last webinar is we asked attendees how the pace of innovation will continue post pandemic. And it was kind of interesting, over 50% of respondents said that they think that innovation, the pace of innovation will increase. Um, so my question for you guys is like, what one, what's your reaction to this? And do you think companies will come out of this pandemic accelerating their digital transformation efforts, um, just given how important e-commerce and digital is these days? Yeah, I can go first. I think, yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, that's that's not surprising. I think, um, yes, you will need to increase your pace of innovation. I think if you would, it would have been really hard for people to imagine, people that have omni-channel, um, retail businesses, if you would have said all of your other points of distribution are going to be closed except for your digital points for, you know, two months, what would you do? I think people would have found that question uh, uh, unanswerable, right? They wouldn't have been able, been able to get their heads around it. So I think now that you're living through that, that's going to help stimulate change. I think innovation kind of comes out of necessity. And I hope it's not innovation for innovation's sake or you know what i call pr innovation we were able to you know make this hologram in a window or something that really adds no value to the customer but i hope it's innovation that comes out that if a customer is concerned with safety in your store now they don't have to interact with your sales associate they can just leave without having to uh you know tender at a register and you can have contactless payment or you can ensure that your supply chain is virus free. Those kind of innovations, I think, are going to be critical. And I think companies are definitely accelerating their digital transformation in that direction, for sure. Shauna, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, it. you know, again, we're, we're kind of in a unique situation because we always have been digital first. Um, but I, that being said, um, we already were having a lot of conversations around digital innovation and um, and a lot of things were in motion. I think that what's going to happen here is that we will accelerate that pace. Absolutely. Um, you know, just given the customer's demand for what we're seeing mm -hmm. right now, the products we carry, because um, I do think that sh uh, shopping behaviors will change. I think that, you know, one of the one of our biggest problems is that I think people just don't necessarily know about us. I think once you find out that there is fsastore.com where every single product is eligible you don't have to look it up or figure it out and and you don't need to keep your receipts and mail it into your health benefits rates like literally you just swipe the card and you're done um i didn't even know that now i know right. that <laughs> so i you know it's like one of those things where when i tell people about where i work and i you don't even really have to say anything beyond like oh it's fsastore.com and everyone goes i need that <laughs> i need that so you know <laughs> we, we have to um this is giving us a lot of awareness because people are as they're being furloughed or laid off we suspect you know they're they're like i've got this account you know i've already contributed yeah. to it it's it's money sitting there or maybe they're dipping into their hsas early which they were planning to save for retirement but now they're like i got to maximize what i have so they're searching so you know i think um we're in a unique moment and we really want to take advantage of that in that we want people to learn about us and also stay with us. So we're really, um, we're really thinking a lot about scalability and how we're, we're going to be building for growth in the future. Um, uh, so it's like changing a little bit how we're thinking about it. You know, we used to think, oh, there's a really a known seasonal curve. And now that's kind of 
a little bit blown out of the water. Um, so, you know, when every day, you know, we, I've heard a lot of anecdotal stories from people saying, you know, every day is Cyber Monday for us right now. It's like, and the platforms are talking about that, you know, they're like, oh my yeah. God, we, every day is Cyber Monday. Well, you know, yeah. we, we've always, our biggest day is not Cyber Monday. It's always been New Year's Eve because that's December 31st is the deadline. And, you know, we are like having to change to an every day is New Year's Eve mentality, you know, and, and really um, build for that, that level of growth, because we don't know, we just don't know how behavior will shift, but I don't think it's going to go back to the way it was. Um, so for us, it's that, that type of growth mindset in terms of innovation and, and, and maximizing on the traffic that's coming our way. Yeah, and I guess when we look at the innovation that will happen, that will kind of come out of it, you know, Tim, you know, you talked about innovation relating to scale, Shauna, and Tim kind of mentioned, you know, innovation really tied to some of the necessities that that have come out of COVID-19. Do you think that the innovation for the foreseeable future will be all COVID-related priorities, like, you know, virus-free, touchless, you know, shopping, um, ship from store, or will there be other aspects of innovation that will come back to the forefront? Who's that for? Is that for Jane? Oh, Tim. Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I'll just answer no matter what. Yeah, she, I think. <laughs> Good. I think, it was um, I think I, listen, I think what, I don't think it'll necessarily all be COVID related, right? Like we launched online styling appointments because people couldn't come into stores, but people still wanted to talk about what they wanted to wear. So is that COVID yeah. related? I mean, I don't think that's helping against our fight against COVID, but it's just more people at home related. So I think if you went in a store, you were shopping in different channels, you probably went for the experience or the convenience. So I think the technology and the innovations are going to try to drive those things. So whether it be same day delivery, driving convenience, which is also I know that it's clean and, and I don't need to be concerned with it. Um, but also, what is that experience? How is it delivered? Is it tailored? What's special about it? Because people still want to have some kind of experience. Their experience was just hindered because they don't want to get sick in a store with a lot of people with masks on and sanitizer. So. Um, it, I, I don't know that it's all going to be COVID related. I think people will still want a little bit of relief and some enjoyment in, in retail. JB, what do you think? Yeah, so fully agree with Tim. So COVID is is a, it's, it's a rea reality now, but I believe that a lot of the innovations are, are scalable for the future regardless. So if you look at most of the innovation that I, I can probably see as, as driving value in the long term, it's around that customer experience. So there are traditional on offline retailers who have an yeah. amazing in-store experience, and they've really struggled to drive that online um, kind of connection to this is the same company and the same brand. So the first thing is that the internal silos within companies. Um, so we're a business which sells across companies into all sorts of different departments. And we find that, yeah. okay, this one doesn't speak to this one, this one doesn't speak to this one. And we have this unique situation where actually it's the first time where many companies just through necessity have to talk through different departments. There's not one department leading the, the conversation. Logistics, CRM teams are not the afterthought. They're actually on the, the same level as anyone else in that discussion because without them, we don't know how we're gonna to talk to the customer. We don't know how we're gonna get it to the customer. It doesn't matter what you price it at if we don't know these two things. So all of yeah. this sort of comes together. So it's a, a really unique situation. Um, and I, I think yes, that there's there's innovation around that customer experience, which is which is going to be applicable in in the long term. And I've seen some amazing kind of concepts and people being really creative about some of the ideas that could improve the experience. So if you look back to to what I mentioned around my really bad experience with um, with a grocery store, so I tried to order online and no delivery slots. And I saw I was looking yeah. for what's the answer to this. And well, I, I saw a, a couple of discussions around well, why don't they set up neighborhood deliveries? So you have a pre-agreed slot and actually I know before I shop that there is a slot for me. So maybe I would consider mm -hmm. purchasing from, from the store that did that. And, and I'm sure there's tons of other amazing ideas, but that's something that can help scale the business and control costs in the long term. And I think is a benefit for, for any business, COVID or not, I would say. So it seems like the innovation is framed around customer experience, but a lot of the customer experience these days is is impacted by COVID. So um it's a little bit of both in some ways yeah well it's yeah. interesting jamie's restaurant example 
I mean, if they they realized they could do something that was going to take two years, they could do it in two months. So why were they planning on doing it two years later? I mean, they obviously could have done it sooner. So I think that's the mindset that we need to be thinking and and they they'll now make it through. OK. Yeah, I think it was just an accelerator of it was an accelerator of the growth. But, you know, at the end of the day with our business, you know, people are still having babies at the same rate. They've always had babies. So, you know, we sell a lot of baby products, too. So, you know, it's it's there's always going to be a need for these other products. You know, that's not really going to go away. But I do think that what everyone has said, I echo it. it people are just going to prioritize things a little differently. And um, and I think for many more traditional retailers, you know, and I've, I've worked at some over the years, like now, you know, this is gonna push digital to the forefront of those conversations in a way that it may not have been in the past. And even for companies that are digital first, like ours, it's going to change the way we look at the pace of innovation, collaboration, decision-making, all of that um, to, to really accelerate. Awesome. I'm going to, Akilis had one more question, so I want to ask, I want to direct that to Tim, because he's asking if you ship from store, and if not, if that's something you're considering. Yeah, we actually don't ship from store, uh, and it's been reprioritized to be higher on the list. Um, so, yeah, we we now are going to be doing that sooner rather than later. Um, so, yeah, we were just talking to some of the, some of our, our, um, colleagues out on the West Coast. So we would have been able to use our West Coast stores as distribution nodes on the West Coast had those still been operable as DCs and we'd be able to continue to move through the inventory. So uh, yeah, part of this will be uh, being able to ship from store will be a big piece of it. I think it's, you know, omni-channel is really being able to leverage inventory across all channels. So right now we've got, you know, stores with Hugo Boss inventory, wholesalers with Hugo Boss inventory, digital retailers with Hugo Boss inventory all just sitting there. I mean, that can't go on forever. Um, there needs to be just one central point of inventory that can be fed out to everybody really, really easily wherever the demand is. It just shouldn't be sitting in stores now with, you know, with collecting dust. Yeah, and then having to move it around based on when stores open, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's inoperable for a long term like this. So I'm going to ask you all one kind of question to, to close out the conversation. You know, as we're um, innovating and continuing to push digital forward, what are some hurdles that could prevent the digital acceleration? Um, and how can your organizations overcome those challenges? Shonda, do you want to go first on this one? Um, you know, I think for us, the supply chain uncertainty is, um, you know, we, we don't know. Um, you know, we, we see things coming in from China and this isn't just us. I think it's happening to a lot of retailers. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to know, you know, we really truly are a global economy and, and every country is being hit with this and they're all, they all have their own challenges and everyone's on their different timeline with COVID-19. So, um, you know, I, I know that's like, it maybe isn't quite answering the, the innovation question, but, um, but, you know, in a way that, that does that will impact our organization. Like I think it will a lot of companies. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think, um, you know, I, I, we've always had, you know, it, as a digital, we're a little bit unique because we're, we're always thinking about digital. And so I don't think it's always the top priority regardless, you know, we just, but that, but that's probably the thing that's on my mind as we try to grow and scale right now. Yeah, innovation doesn't always have to be digital, right? It could be in supply chain, it could be in a lot of aspects. But I think a lot of that's really out of everyone's hands. You know, it's like that's it's more of a I don't know if it's like a long term robot. It's just more of a it's like a, a just the state of retail right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, Apple announced that they're looking at India to build um, iPhones. So, people, you know, companies of all sides are thinking about about the supply chain. Right. Tim, what do you think the hurdles could be? Uh, yeah, hurdles. I think um, resources, right? It's going to be tough. Capital, um, existing in investments, investments that are already in place. I mean, I guess it's uh, short term thinking is probably the biggest hurdle. Um, and the biggest way to overcome that is to think and play the long game, to think about the state of the organization in two to three years from now, not just investments for this quarter or what's holiday going to be like, but to start now and to think 
if this is accelerating, if this does come back, if this does continue, if this is the new normal, uh, how do I want to be strong in that? And what direction should I start doing right now to be as formidable as possible when we get there? So I think it's people's minds and short-term thinking that's the biggest hurdle. Getting people to think more long-term and really be strategic, which is hard when, when it's hard to plan because we're all kind of triaging on a crisis. It's, it'll be yeah, amazing. or if you spend a hundred million dollars on stores and you've got rents and you've got all these other things, yeah, it's hard yep. to think about that and to move beyond it. But it's you, you, you have to try. Jamie, what do you think? Yeah, and I guess to add on to that, I, it's important to recognize that everyone's in the same situation. It's not a unique thing to to your business. Everyone else is also trying to figure it out on on the fly. And um, Tim made a really good point that. It's it's great to be thinking short term now because we need to survive. But actually, you know what? Things will change. Things will improve, and there are some things that you need to start working on. If you're just thinking short term now, um, potentially, yeah, you can miss uh, some opportunities uh, in in the long term to to grow. And I I think the, the macro environment right now is set up to to drive a huge amount of demand online. Yeah. And now it's okay. So how do we? satisfy that demand there's a unique set of customers which are coming to, to businesses so are we just going to try and survive and somehow serve them in this environment or are we already going to start to think about what happens after this to yeah. do we just think of these as short-term customers or do we think about these as long-term customers i think most companies haven't really got to that stage yet and um, particularly in i would say the europe and, and the us where you still i guess switching on the news every day and, and trying to figure out what's going on but um, I guess in China, where it's a little bit more progressed, um, I think someone mentioned earlier, they're looking to that as a, as a pattern to say, well, when do we need to start thinking about these things? Um, well, probably now is the time to start to think about it and start to say, well, what's the plan in, in three months, if this, if this, if this, and, and let's be ready for that mm -hmm. to be able to adapt to it. Yeah, good point. Awesome. Well, Jamie, Tim, Shauna, thank you so much for sharing your insights with the community. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, next week's webinar is Did COVID-19 Kill AI Personalization? And, and my co-founder, Alan Dick, is gonna dig deeper into what you can do to kind of overcome the challenge with algorithms these days. So thank you so much and have a great afternoon, everyone. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.